back is my my younger days. Um, I was a program director at uh, Stoke. And as, in Stoughton, as much power as I had, there was a lot of programs that I was running um, that was very intentional to be very fun focused, but it was not intentional to be inclusive or engaging to all. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, I was 23 years old. I was really just excited to get a league started that had tons of kids in basketball and things like that. Um, and time and time again, the first day I would have, I would have a skills clinic. And what that basically means is that everyone travels around and I would have music blaring. I would have things decorated in the hallway. It was just looking back hindsight, sensory overload, right? But every first day I would realize that I had about five to 10 kids that would drop out of the program. And I was never sure why. I, I could never understand why, why am I keep getting kids that are dropping out? This program, if I say so as myself, is pretty awesome, right? Um, and I started doing some research and asking them, what is happening? Is there something that I did? Is something that the why did? And I remember one mom in particular just said to me, it was just too much for us. It was sensory overload and my child is not used to that. Um, and we would actually appreciate it if we had a, a heads up that this was the, the expectation that we were walking into. And so that really just did not sit well with me, didn't sit well with me at all. Um, I lost sleep for a couple of nights because I felt like I was just not understanding the community. I was not understanding what people needed. I began speaking to one person in particular. Her name is Denise Cave. She actually started Top Soccer in East Bridgewater. And we started connecting on, you know, how can we service just not one type of child, but all children and become a little bit more inclusive for what we were doing. I luckily was able to be promoted uh, to associate exec in East Bridgewater. And when I got there, I was really inclined and passionate about starting something that was a little bit more inclusive. And what you're gonna hear from me is I keep saying the word inclusion, but what I created was not an inclusive program, but we'll get to that. Um, but you know, I really wanted some inclusion program. I thought that was gonna be the goal and that was gonna tell parents that the why was there for them. And what I started to do was just meet with Denise week by week. And every single week there ended up being more and more and more people that she brought along. Before I knew it, I had some sort of community advisory committee that was created right in front of me. Um, we ended up doing some research and looking at inclusive names all around the world. And But in the Y of Australia, they actually had an inclusive program called Yability. And it just really spoke to us, really spoke to Denise. And I said, you know, let's, let's see if we can start that. Let's see if we can create an umbrella of, of what called Yability and then create some, you know, programs underneath it. And so... We came up with three different programs, Swimability, Fitability, and Drums Alive. Um, and we wanted to run those for the East Bridgewater community. Luckily, we found a grant for $16,000 that we wrote for from DDS that was able to provide us with a pilot program for Yability. Um, so as soon as we were able to be awarded that money, we actually opened up our registration um, with the help of the committee of like, you know, being able to have videos, being able to see what you were signing up for. I mean, everything that I did wrong in, in Stoughton, we did right in East Bridgewater. And of course, the YMCA's luck at the time is that I opened this up at on a blizzard, right? Because of course, open house would be on a blizzard. Um, and I was so disappointed that no one's going to show up, but I'm still going to host it. When I tell you we filled up all three classes that first weekend and not only filled it up, but we had parents that just came with their children and were so prepared with paperwork. And I immediately called my exec and said, I don't know what we did, but we're, we're onto something. Um, and the community is telling us that they need these programs and they want these programs. Before I knew it, I had 40 individuals signed up like that. And so a lot of success. We saw a lot of smiles and a lot of greatness, but then we started to see some hurdles that we put in our own way, right? So the first hurdle was staffing. How do we maintain this? How do we keep this going? Uh, it's grant funded. That's going to be a huge hurdle. Um, how, do we, how do we have institutional knowledge? How do we train our staff? That was another hurdle that we saw. Um, member hurdles. Um, we have a community that is sometimes not so um, inclusive uh, or wants to be inclusive or wants to understand somebody different. And so that was a hurdle. Spacing. Uh, trying to find a location to host these programs, um, these sub-separate programs, these specialized programs that I actually created that at the time I thought were inclusive, but these sub-separate programs that we created. We then had relationship building hurdles, uh, staffing hurdles, you know, people not wanting to uh, make the connections or treat people like they are. And so what we quickly realized is that, oops, we need to get some other professionals in the room. We need to get some other people in the room. 
and we can't be limited by our programs. You felt really limited by our programs, right? And so what Sarah and I did, and really mastermind is Sarah, she said, you know, I think it would be really important to get all of the community advisory committees together. And so by the time that Sarah returned, I was shouting liability from the rooftops. I presented at board meetings. People started creating their own programs and community advisory committees naturally and organically across our Y. And we, all of a sudden we had over hundred kids that signed up. We had over hundred people on our community advisory committees and we were sailing. Um, and so we, we said, let's get, this, let's, let's get these people together and let's create a summit. And so we created a summit. Um, we had every individual in a room that Sarah put together, just a fantastic day for everybody. Um, and we shared, we connected, we uh, you know, talked about positives and negatives at each branch, about the programs, about being more inclusive, and what does that look like, the journey to inclusion. Um, and that's when Sarah and I first started realizing, not only did we create a hurdle in ourselves by specialized programs, but we did not create that institutional knowledge that anybody in our YMCA could pick up that program and apply it somewhere else. One of the most unfortunate parts of COVID is, is the staffing crisis um, and the fact that so much institutional knowledge was lost. Um, Roman did a wonderful thing starting these separate programs and we so we don't want to, you know, that was our first step. That was the first phase in our journey and it is, you know, why we're where we are today. Um, but when we created programming and then we lost program staff, we realized very quickly that it needed to be a full culture shift. It needed to live with everyone. It needed to be sustainable. Um, and it needed to go far beyond, oh, we have a program for you. It meets at Monday at 3 p.m. And if you want Tuesdays, you have to drive down to Plymouth or something like that. You know, we felt limited saying that. And with limited staffing, it almost it only became more limiting. You know, so we sort of came back. We sat, we sat in a meeting just like this um, and we made wonderful connections and we wanted to listen and just find out how we could do it better. First, we need to really agree on the definition of inclusion. We have to have some sort of common ground so that we're all having the same conversation. Um, so we said, first, let's start with our frontline staff because this is gonna be really important. Um, and we developed a inclusion training um, just, you know, really defining what is inclusion, what does it mean, what are some, um, you know, lighthearted videos and ways of telling stories to get people there. And it was important to have our CEO talk about his commitment to inclusion so that not only were we training our frontline staff, but we were connecting it all the way to the top. Um, and the commitment that we saw every step of the way. We had to see what we were doing well and, and learn to recognize that. And, and we had to look around our branches and notice that there were individuals with disabilities organically being really successful, finding employment, um, you know, being, we, you know, instead of being known as the mayor of such and such a branch, why is that not just a commonplace thing? You know, how do we make 20 of the person that you know i'm referring to in the back of my head right now and and we know the group exercise class that always has such and such a person in the front row just being so successful why is that not every group exercise class and what is it about that class that makes it successful and so we started really asking ourselves those questions um you know why are we allowing group homes to come and stay to themselves and by nature of the way that they use our branches make members upset because they're displacing space right you know if we have any group of people move around and teenagers right um anyone if they if there's a group of people taking up an area of our building on their own it by nature makes the other people upset <laughs> and resent them and so by allowing that to happen in our branches we're not creating a good culture. So I think we enforce the journey by making space for these conversations. Um, when our CEO makes the board meeting agenda, he's been putting inclusion on it. Um, I've been speaking it, I've spoken at four different board meetings in the last five months, I feel like, um, because it's just, it's, it's commitment. Roman runs, you know, our inclusion committee and our association, we said, you know, I think diversity and inclusion is race, but it's so much more. Why are we not bringing this viability and inclusion work that, that needs to be had around this table too. Um, and so that conversation has started to spin off. So um, we're very much, at, we, we feel that we're very much at the beginning.
a good idea, I should say, not a small idea, a great idea, right? Could really turn into something that transforms not only a branch, but an association. And if I knew back in uh, late 2016 that that one conversation I had with Denise Cave would turn into a culture shift at the Y, you know, I would, I would have pinched myself.